Chris is talking about that <clears throat> third category of people maybe coming out of retirement. I, I think I was reading somewhere this week that Tom Brady's thinking about coming out of retirement again. So, I mean, if, if he can come out of retirement and play football, I mean, anything's possible, right? Well, uh, after a three-week break from uh, baptisms last week, Palm Sunday and Easter, uh, we are returning to our, our study in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Today we come to a passage that records a defining moment in the history of the early church. Uh, Jesus had commanded his disciples to, to go, right, to, make, to, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. But up until this point, really most of the ministry has been in, in Jerusalem among Jewish people, and that is about to change. As we've seen, as the gospel has been preached among the, the Jewish people, there's been this growing tension between the Jewish religious leaders and this new Christian movement. And in today's passage, that tension boils over, and Stephen becomes the first martyr of the Christian faith. And this begins a, a process of Christianity becoming untethered from Judaism. And that is necessary if Judaism is ever going to be anything other than just a, a or if Christianity is going to be ever going to be anything other than just a Jewish sect. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is kind of becoming clear. I mean, they're living in real time, real history as, as this new thing is happening. It's just not clear yet. And so as believers are coming to Christ, they're continuing to live out their faith in, in many of the old forms, right? They, they, we've seen how they, they've continued to go up to the temple. But with the martyrdom of Stephen, a break begins between the church and Judaism, which will allow Christianity truly to become a worldwide movement for all people. One commentator made the point that Stephen died for the difference between Judaism's approach to God and Christianity's. Stephen died for the difference between Judaism's approach to God and Christianity's. Judaism's approach, of course, was wrapped up in the Old Covenant and the, those forms. It was about the law and the temple and, and these kinds of things. Christianity's approach was centered on Christ. Luke wants us to understand that this break between the church and Judaism, that, that it was fundamentally about the reality that Christianity was something new. It was something different. It was a different approach to God through Jesus alone, without the need for priests and temples and animal sacrifices and these kinds of things. Because of Jesus, the heavens are wide open. And so let's look at this passage. <clears throat> we're we're going to look at the opposition, kind of the... the, the, the yeah, the people that came against Stephen, the opposition that they had to what he taught, how he defends himself, and then ultimately kind of the gospel he preached that, that got him killed. And uh, there are a lot of verses. There's 71 verses in our passage. Maybe you're wondering why we didn't read the passage today. Well, that's why it's 71 verses. And, uh, and so uh, I'm going to have to summarize a whole bunch. I, I hope you had a chance to read it this week. If not, uh, I encourage you to read it today. It's a fascinating passage. Let's look first at the opposition to the gospel. <clears throat> you might remember that uh, we met Stephen earlier in chapter 6. Um, he is one of the, the seven men when they had the issue with uh, the Hellenistic widows being overlooked in the daily serving of food. He was one of the seven that, that was qualified and godly and selected to help serve um, in that way. But, but Stephen was not just involved in care for the widows. He, he had a ministry very similar to the apostles. I mean, he's teaching he is performing signs and wonders. And so look at verse 8 of chapter 6. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and they disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so Stephen was part of the, the Greek-speaking part of the church. There was a he Hebraic part. There was a Hellenistic part. He was part of the Hellenistic part. The synagogue of the freedmen, it was a Greek-speaking synagogue, and so it's very possible this was the synagogue that he had connected to as, in his Jewish faith. <clears throat> we don't know for sure, but, but men from this synagogue, they don't like what Stephen is teaching, and they dispute with him. <clears throat> now, Luke doesn't necessarily tell us what Stephen is teaching, but 
He came to faith under the teaching of the apostles. He was discipled under the ministry of the apostles. And so we can assume he taught very similar things to what they taught, right? Jesus was crucified according to God's plan. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day. Uh, he would have proclaimed forgiveness of sins through Jesus. And because of that, a new way was opened to the Father. That, that access to God is through Jesus. This message of access to God did not include the law. It did not include the temple and these things. And this was offensive to those from the synagogue of the freedmen. And so they, they seek to silence Stephen. Verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of of an angel, and I think that last phrase is reflecting. He is a spirit-filled believer, one who'd spent time with Jesus, who was growing in Jesus. I mean, it just it, it it reflected in his his being, his countenance, his presence, even in this moment of hostility. Now, the general charge against Stephen is that he was against Moses and God. He was against the law. He was against God. The specific charge they make is that he never ceases to speak words against this holy place the temple, and the law. That's in verse 13. <clears throat> so it's a charge of sort of distorted truth and, and just outright falsehoods that they, they bring against him. And so they, they say he said that Jesus said he would destroy the temple. And, and Jesus never said that. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed, but he never said he would destroy it. And so Stephen certainly was not proclaiming that message. That's a falsehood. But the charge that he had said that Jesus would change the customs that Moses delivered, uh, it was true. In many ways, that was true. Jesus did come to change the, the customs that Moses delivered. We, we, you know, Jesus heals on the Sabbath and is doing those kind of things. And it just drives the Jewish leaders crazy, right? Because he's changing the customs of Moses. And so certainly Stephen did teach that. All of this to the Jewish religious leaders, to these men from the, the freedmen, I mean, it sounded like blasphemous words spoken against Moses and against God. And blasphemy is worthy of death. So the high priest said, are these things so? And with that, we come to Stephen's defense, his kind of rebuttal, how he responds to these charges brought against him. <clears throat> And that takes up most of chapter 7, and uh, it's the longest speech in all of the book of Acts. And uh, that, that's an indication how important Luke believes this is for us to understand this, that he gives so much time to this. And so because it's so long, I'm going to have to summarize a lot. There, there's two kind of core things that I see that Luke that, or Stephen does in his, his sermon. He, he first focuses on what the Old Testament said about the law the temple, and as well, the land. Uh, these were things to the Jewish people that, that, that they believe were necessary forms. They were necessary part of how we have access to God. These are, are how God showed up to meet with his people. Stephen's going to challenge that thinking and demonstrate that these things rightly understood had a greater fulfillment. So that's one thing he's going to do. The second thing he's going to do is confront the Jewish religious leaders <clears throat> that with the truth with uh, crucifying the Messiah, they have done what the father, their fathers have done all through history, and that is silence God's messengers. And so those are the two things that he really does. So uh, in terms of what he says about the land, the law, and the, the temple, let me just offer a few thoughts in summary. In terms of the land, and, and you can go through it, he, he's, he recounts kind of an amazing history, Jewish history, the Israel's history. So in terms of the land, he talks about how God showed up and met Abraham called him when he was not in the promised land, but when he, he was in Mesopotamia. He also talks about how God showed up in Joseph's life in Egypt. He was with him. He blessed him. He did amazing things with Joseph, not in the promised land, but in Egypt. He talks about how God showed up and called Moses. You know, Moses had fled from Egypt and was out in the wilderness for those 40 years. And God showed up in the, the, in the, the, around Mount Sinai, and, and there was, Moses saw the burning bush, and, and he... 
in that encounter, God says to Moses, take your sandals off because the, the land you're standing on, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. And the point is, that's not the promised land. That's out in the wilderness. But it's holy ground because God's there. In other words, it's not just the promised land. It's wherever God shows up that is holy ground. In terms of the law, the most important thing that Stephen said, <clears throat> I believe, is found in verse 37. In a section where he's talking about Moses, he says this. Verse 37, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. So Moses was a prophet, right? God gave the law to Israel through him. But Moses, in the law, said that there will be another prophet like him. And he's pointing to Jesus. And so if the... Part of what Stephen is saying is that the Jewish people actually understood the law and the lawgiver, he himself said there is a greater fulfillment. There's another prophet coming. And that would be truly obeying the law is to realize there's something greater coming. In terms of the temple, uh, he traces the history of first the tabernacle how, and how it followed them during their wilderness wanderings and how it was brought into the land and then how eventually that they, uh, Solomon built the temple. And uh, in verse 48, he quotes what King Solomon said at the dedication of the temple. This, this was uh, from back in 1 Kings 8, 27. Verse, uh, in, in Luke 7, 48, he says, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. That's what Solomon had said, even at the dedication of the temple. They, they knew God didn't dwell. I mean, God was going to show up there. That was where he said his presence would dwell. But he didn't ultimately dwell there you cannot contain God in, in houses made by hands in, in the last part of the verse it says as the prophet says and then he goes on to cite Isaiah 66 1 and 2 which makes this point that God is not contained in man-made houses and so the point is that uh, the temple which could not contain God it was never meant to limit God doing a new thing in redemptive history, right? The, the, the Jewish people were saying, that's it. This is the ultimate fulfillment. And yet even in the dedication of the temple, there was always something greater. And, and this, if rightly understood, it pointed to something new, something greater that would happen. So the land, the law, and the temple, they're, they're all important. And, and, and Stephen actually, they say he speaks against them, but if you look at it, he really speaks very respectfully of these things. <clears throat> he understands their, their purpose and their intent. They had their place in God's redemptive plan, but, but Stephen is saying they're never meant to suggest that God would never do a new thing and there, that there wasn't a greater fulfillment. When, when rightly understood, these all pointed to a greater fulfillment. The second thing he does is, in his defense is really boldly confront the religious leaders <clears throat> by telling them that they are just like their fathers who have always resisted the Holy Spirit. If you read through, again, his defense, he, he makes this point over and over. He demonstrates this from Israel's history. But let me read one passage, starting in verse 38. Uh, this is a passage when Moses was on the mountain. He was receiving the law. It was a significant moment. And this is what Stephen says. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him at Mount Sinai, so he's talking about Moses, and with our fathers. <clears throat> he received living oracles to give to us. And there, so there's respect, right? I mean, he calls them living oracles. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days. Stephen makes the point that in this moment, I mean, it's such a holy moment. God was giving them the law through Moses, the lawgiver, and yet the people absolutely missed what God was doing even in this moment. And they refused to obey Moses and thus God. And so Stephen confronts them that the Jewish leaders of his day, they're just like their fathers. They refuse to listen. They refuse to understand what God is doing. They're doing the very same thing now. And Stephen, with great boldness, in verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. He uses language that God 
used for the, the children of Israel in the wilderness, right? He called them stiff-necked. He called them uncircumcised in heart. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Israel repeatedly missed what God was doing. The fathers had killed the prophets who proclaimed the coming of the righteous one and the Jewish leaders to whom Stephen is speaking, they actually killed the righteous one. Stephen says, you who received the law, you did not keep it. And so Stephen, he puts the land, the law, and the temple in the proper place, demonstrating they were never meant to be the final act in God's redemptive history. And he confronts a little bit of a cold this week. And he confronts the current generation with the truth that just like their fathers, they never listened to God's messengers. In fact, they, they killed them. And the next thing that Stephen says will get himself killed. He pr- proclaims the truth of the gospel that through Jesus there is full and unfettered access to God. Verse 54. So now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen gets a glimpse into heaven. And, and this is not, sometimes you, we read about people having visions of heaven. This is not a vision. He got somehow opens up uh, and and he actually sees heaven and he sees Jesus standing at God's right hand. Usually we read about Jesus being seated at God's right hand, but here he is standing. And uh, commentators have different ideas about why he's standing. It, It may be that he is standing in a welcome to Stephen. It may be that he is standing as a, as Stephen's advocate, as his defender. Whatever the case, Stephen Sees what he actually knows to be true, and that is that access to the Father is through Jesus and Jesus alone. Unhindered access. It's not the law. It's not the temple. It's Jesus. In Jesus, God has done a new thing. Jesus is the fulfillment of redemptive history. He's the fulfillment of what the law and the temple pointed to. And so what Stephen's sort of saying is like, why hang on to this old system? Think about just the temple. That's where one man once a year could go into the very holy of holies. One man into the presence of God while everyone else was outside. Why hold on to this old system of animal, daily animal sacrifices that never actually took care of sin when there is one who's made the full and complete payment for sin? Why hang on to the old when God has done something new? That's essentially what Stephen is saying. In Christ, there's access to God. The heavens are open. This is for Jewish and Gentile alike. This is the good news of the gospel that Stephen preached. Verse 57, But they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. Him. And witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is a euphemism for the believer, you know, that, that they're not ultimately dead, right? They're, they're, they're going into God's presence. And so Stephen died for the difference between Judaism's approach to God and Christianity. He died proclaiming the truth that that Jesus is where access to God is found. And Luke is spending so much time on this message because he wants us to understand this. He wants to understand this necessary break from Judaism. He wants us to understand that access to God, full and fettered access, is through Jesus and not these old forms. 
Now, before we talk a little bit about application, I, there's a couple of things I just want to highlight and, and mention before we move to, to some thoughts on application. There's a lot in this passage. Um, we could have spent a lot of time just looking at Stephen, right? I mean, there's a, there's a message or two just on Stephen's life. He is amazing. Uh, the, the, the name of this sermon series is Loyal to Jesus. He is loyal to Jesus. He is loyal to Jesus in his life. Um, just the godliness, and it, it's, it's clear that the, the character of Christ was formed in his life. That's why he was selected to serve in the way he did. And in his life, he proclaimed Jesus. He was loyal to Jesus in his death, not backing away from proclaiming the truth, even when he knew it would get him killed. He is uh, he's amazing. You know, and we, when you look at even the, the things that are on his heart and his lips as he is being stoned. He's entrusting his spirit to Jesus. And even as he's being stoned, as rocks are hitting him, Father, forgive them. I mean, it's just so like Christ. May I be more like Stephen. May we all be more like Stephen, loyal to Jesus in the good times and the hard times, faithful to proclaim the gospel. The other thing I want to mention is that Luke uses this account to introduce us to one who, who becomes a central figure in, in the advancement of the gospel in the latter chapters of the book of Acts. And that's Apostle Paul, right? He's called Saul here. He's standing. He's in hearty agreement with what happens. Um, let me read the first three verses of chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen, and they made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off <clears throat> men and women and committed them to prison. And, and so uh, he proves of the execution. He becomes a central figure in, in this, this persecution that breaks out uh, against the church. But as a result of this persecution, the church is scattered. They've been staying in Jerusalem, but now they're, they're scattered. And Jesus is commanded to take the gospel not only to Jer Jerusalem, but to Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Uh, they're out there now. I mean, the gospel is going to those places. This necessary break between the church and Judaism which really is beginning here. It will become fleshed out in some other things that happens in the, in the book of Acts, but it, it will become very clear to these early Christians. And thankfully so, that one doesn't have to be Jewish first to become a Christian. That's what becomes clear. Now, let me offer just a couple thoughts related to application. And, and the first one is for those who are not yet followers of Jesus. What's the message here for you? I believe it is that full access to God is available through Jesus alone for you. Full access to God is available through Jesus and Jesus alone. Sometimes in, you know, people I've talked to in the past having kind of gospel spiritual conversations, people will say something to the effect like, <clears throat> I don't think I can become a Christian. I, I'm, if you knew what I've done, I haven't been good enough. I've never been in the church. I mean, they, they kind of list all of these things about how they've behaved, how they've lived, what they've done, what they haven't done, and, and sort of say, I, I don't think I can, how can I be a Christian? The point is, full, unfettered access is through Jesus alone. It is not through living a good enough life. It's not through going to the right church or the right group. It's about faith in the forgiveness that Jesus offers. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been a part of the church. None of that matters. What matters is coming to Jesus in faith. We, we, we repent of our sin. We turn away from kind of walking our own way, living independent of God, and we come to God, to Jesus, and, and we understand that what he did on the cross, he died for my sin. We trust him. We embrace it and, and trust that what he did was for me. He lived a good life for me. He forgave me. That's the message for you out of this passage. Full access to God is available through Jesus and Jesus alone. For those of us who are followers of Christ, 
Part of the message here, I think, is just as, just as you initially gained access to God through faith in Jesus, <clears throat> that access is maintained by Jesus. Sometimes, I mean, we, we can be so clear, and we can claim, and we know that we enter into a relationship with, with God through grace alone. It's just all about what Jesus did, and we believe that, and we trust that we into a relationship with God, but sometimes we suddenly slide into thinking that this relationship now is maintained by how well I do, by do I go to the right church, do I have all the right forms, and, 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 and am I living this out in all the right ways? And we begin to look at ourselves as the one who maintain this connection to God. Now, as disciples of Jesus, we do strive to love God by obeying Him, but this does not maintain our connection to Him. Our ongoing access is maintained by Jesus alone, just like our initial access was found. Walk in this truth. Walk in the grace of this truth. You have full access that's maintained by Jesus to the Father. Here's the other thing I want to say uh, that I think this, this passage is, is really as we think about Stephen and how he defends the gospel, it's this point. <clears throat> we need to preach and defend a gospel of full and fettered access to God through Jesus alone. We need to preach and defend a gospel of full and fettered access to God through Jesus alone. Stephen gave his life for this truth. As, as, as we're trying to help others find and follow Jesus, make sure we're really clear that we present the gospel and that we don't add things to it. I've known people who at one time were involved in a certain Christian community. It could be a group on campus, it could be a church, and uh, for various reasons, God led them to step away from that Christian community to connect to a different place, and that when they did that, people from the original group began to shun them and treat them as if they were not a believer. This is not defending the gospel, that we have full and fettered access to God through Jesus and Jesus alone. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, we, we may love our, our context. We may love our group. We may love our church and, and, and think that, man, this is the best place for people to be. But if we ever sort of suggest that, that if someone goes elsewhere, they seek Jesus with a different church or a different group, that, that somehow maybe they're not even a believer, that's not defending the true gospel, that we have full and fettered access to God through Jesus alone. And so let's make sure we, we don't add anything to the gospel. No ritual, no rules, no how it has to be like this. It's just about faith in Jesus. Let's defend that kind of gospel. Stephen died for the difference between Judaism's approach to God and Christianity. Uh, that's what we defend, that's what we proclaim full access to God through Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, your faithful servant, Stephen. Thank you for this, this model, uh, this, this man who's the first martyr of the Christian faith. Uh, may we be more like him. May we be men and women, children who, who boldly proclaim what is true and that we would be so connected to you that uh, yeah, we would reflect you in these things. God, we pray that as a people, as a church, we would know and understand this access we have to you, that we would live it, and that we would experience it, and it'd be the gospel that we proclaim, full access through Jesus and Jesus alone. And Jesus, we are so grateful that we live in the, the area of the new covenant. It's all by grace. It's by faith in what you have done. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.